things started rolling and I didn't see anything. And I saw, I saw a shadow. That's all I saw. The face of a woman in distress, her husband attacked by an apparent stranger. Just some unknown person in the woods who shot him for no apparent reason. And I called, I called, I, I just, I, I ran. I didn't know what else to do. Before. Wife Chasey Pointer appears distressed, but to those who know her, Chasey's a crocodile tears. My first reaction in my head was, she killed him, didn't she? Had Chasey Pointer murdered her husband, Robert, how would detectives prove their case? What was the evidence which would uncover a killer's mistake? on a remote dirt road. Tell us what, what, what happened. I heard a shot, and the jeep started rolling, and I didn't see anything, and I saw, I saw a shadow. That's all I saw. Robert Pointer has been gunned down, his distraught wife, Chasey, the only witness. You want to go help me? My jeep is stuck in the back, around the corner, and he's been shot in the head, please. I... Roy City Police Department got a phone call around 10.45, 10.47 p.m. It's a Friday night. Um, lady, they could barely hear anything. She's running, they hear her breathing heavily. Uh, they get a ping from the 911 uh, where her cell phone is. It's off County Road 2595, which is just south of the Roy City High School. Um, it, the County Road doesn't even really appear to be a County Road. It looks more like a field. They go out there and they respond very quickly. They're on scene less than three minutes. Miss Pointer, yeah. you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just I can't see his face. Right. <laughs> Jeff Kovach, the assistant district attorney for Hunt County, would work hand in hand with police on the investigation that followed. They get out there and they see a woman. She has blood on her. Uh, she's hyperventilating. Um, saying that somebody shot her husband down the road. He's around, he's around the corner. Once they got there, they immediately made contact with her, and their body cameras were rolling. Robert, Robert, Robert Pointer. Robert a, Pointer? Yes, yeah, he's a firefighter. Just, just breathe for me. That's why it's blowing me. Body cameras are, are used to record everything as it is. JC, do you mind if I take some pictures of you real quick? It's, it removes interpretation. It removes, I forgot I said this, or I didn't say this, I said that. So it's a silent witness that's always credible. The recordings would become an essential part of the detective's hunt for a killer. As one officer interviewed the frantic woman, another, loaded gun in hand, went cautiously in search of the victim. Probably half a mile down the road around a bend that's heavily wooded, Robert Pointer was sitting there in Chasey Pointer's Jeep with a shotgun blast to the head. Officers quickly noted the peculiarities of the scene. An all-terrain vehicle apparently stranded in the mud, a dead man in the driver's seat with a single gunshot wound to his head. No immediate signs of a struggle. Was this a random tragedy or a targeted attack? Stricken wife, Chasey Pointer, now suddenly a widow, told officers that the victim was a first responder like them, part of a brotherhood of dedicated public servants. Bob Pointer, otherwise known as Captain Robert Pointer, is a, a well-respected firefighter uh, in University Park, which is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. Bob joined the fire department when he was just 28 years old and uh, he went on to have quite a distinguished career. He was, a, I would say, a true firefighter's firefighter. I mean, he loved doing that, and he had zero fear of doing it, and he was, but he was very smart. He was always calm. 
He was never, never get worked up, he's never raised his voice. He just knew exactly what he was doing at all times. In the town of Royce City, Texas, Captain Robert Pointer's quiet heroism was well known. Fellow firefighter Mark McAdams remembers the last blaze they ever fought together. It was a, a six alarm fire, the biggest fire in our, our city's history. And there was a little girl, I don't know how old she was, five or six, little blonde headed girl. She was scared and she was crying and <clears throat> Bob noticed. And there's a picture of him and he's sweating, he's hot, and he's bending down and he's hugging the little girl who he didn't even know, just letting her know, hey, we're fine, everybody's okay, we're safe. And that's who he was. Captain Pointer met his first wife, Amy, at high school. Bob's um, just, you know, a good guy. He has married his childhood sweetheart, Amy. The couple tied the knot in the late 80s. Together for 20 years, they had two daughters, Nicole and Natalie. Man, he loved his girls. Uh, he would literally work his fingers to the bone for those girls. And he would take every opportunity he could to work extra jobs, to work extra hours, to work overtime, to do whatever he could to earn money, and, and that money was always for his girls. His girls also included the toddler daughter of wife number two, Chasey. As the only witness to his shooting, what could Chasey tell investigators? We've been having problems, and we, I was coming to beat him at the Jackson Box so we could talk. Uh -huh. We used to stop and get tacos at, at Jackson Box when he'd come home late from work. When I went off the road, that's when I called him and I said, I need you to come help me. And he said, where are you? And I told him, I said, I'm on the dirt road. That's all I know. I don't know the numbers. And so. The body cam footage is quite powerful. It shows her panting and nervous and and every emotion that she has. Breathe, breathe for me, Miss Pointer. Calm down and breathe for me, OK? Yeah, I got some questions. I, I'm trying to fill in some holes, OK? okay, okay. Well, have you ever been out here before? No. No, I've, never, I've never been out here before. Only tonight, right now. Yes, yes. She claims that she, her truck got stuck in the mud and that her husband came out to rescue her. Hours later, in a police station interview room, Chasey would explain to detectives that the couple had arranged to meet at a local fast food restaurant. On the way, she had taken a wrong turn onto an unmaintained track. Her Jeep stuck in the mud. She called her husband for help. Bob immediately rushed to his young wife's aid. This truck uh, can't make it all the way down because he doesn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle. So he stops about halfway from the main road, and she meets him there, and she walks him back uh, to her Jeep, and he gets in the Jeep. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this, this guy comes out with a gun and shoots him. A post-mortem would later find that Bob had received a single gunshot wound at point-blank range. The wadding was still in the temple of the side of his head. And I didn't see anything. And I saw, I saw a shadow. That's all I saw. And when I walked up to him, I yelled his name. And I just felt something on me. And I got my, I had already, I had my phone in my back pocket. And I called, I called, I, I just, I, I ran. I didn't know what else to do. Already, officers were noticing things that didn't quite add up. Of course, that didn't make sense to the police department because they hadn't had a murder at that time in 12 years, and there's not just random people out in, in the woods killing people here in Roy City. Let me ask you this, okay, and I need to be honest with me, okay? okay. Were you out here with anyone else no. other than... No, I was out here by myself. It, it isn't adding up to cops, so they take Chasey in for questioning. Detectives had a hunch that Bob's widow knew more than she was letting on, but what? So she knew that this damsel in distress uh, tactic, um, that this would, you know, cause some distress in him and that she would be able to lure him to wherever she needed him to be to get the job done. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required.
In the USA, men are far more likely to be killed by someone they know than by a stranger. Detectives investigating the death of a respected firefighter naturally examined Bob Pointer's personal life, starting with his seven-year marriage. Chasey and Robert didn't have the most ideal start to their relationship. They started off as an affair. Bob and Chasey start seeing each other around December 2007. Bob was still married then to his childhood sweetheart, Amy, but not for long. One of their daughters found out that her father was cheating on their mum. Nicole tells mom that dad's having an affair with this other woman. The other woman was younger, closer in age, in fact, to his teenage daughters than to him. It didn't stop her setting her sights on the popular captain. The team investigating Bob's murder discovered that what Chasey wanted, Chasey tended to get. Chasey Tyler Mormon is a 20-year-old nurse's aide, and she's a flirt. She's been hanging around Bob's fire station, checks to see when Bob's gonna be there, makes sure that he sees her, and little by little, she worms her way into his life. She was younger, and she told him things he wanted to hear, and she knew exactly what she was doing. So she was the one that, that pursued him, and she really, really pushed it. And unfortunately, Bob, he just, he took it all in. Brian Frederick is a criminologist who has studied the Chasey Pointer story. He believes that Chasey saw Bob as a challenge. So once um, Chasey Pointer set her sights on, on him, right, um, all bets were off. Uh, I imagine uh, the fact that he was married um, and maybe unavailable was uh, sort of a game for her. You know, and if she could get him away from his wife, um, that would be a true test of her ability to have some sort of control over him. The scheme was a success. Bob and Amy's 20-year marriage fell apart. By May 2009, Chasey was pregnant with Bob's child. December 28th, 2009, Chasey and Bob get married. They've been seeing each other now for two years, and now they have a little child together. The honeymoon period, if there ever was one, wasn't to last. Bob's workmates would later reveal to investigators that they witnessed firsthand how volatile the newlyweds' relationship could be. She had real bad mood swings. Um, she would come sometimes, and she would be she would be smiling, and then the next thing you know, she would they would be in the office, and she'd be screaming at him. Chasey also proved to be a drain on the family finances. She was a very manipulative person. Um, a very uh, materialistic person. I mean, when you looked at her text messages with Robert, it was one big purchase or vacation to the next. That's how she seemed to live. It was like, what's my next big purchase? What's my next vacation? That's that's kind of how she lives. Rapidly building an intriguing picture of a roller coaster romance, detectives discovered that by 2012, the relationship was already heading for stormy waters. About three years into this marriage, Chasey and Bob are not getting along so well. Um, they're fighting. It was uh, pretty evident that there were problems. You could see it and, you know, in phone conversations, uh, conversations they would have at the fire station. She was uh, sometimes really loud, and uh, she would call him every name in the book when they would get into arguments about stuff. Chasey would later confess in a police interview that she and her husband had been growing apart. She transformed her physical appearance and had been pursuing interests that did not include Bob. She says Bob doesn't find her as attractive anymore, but she's getting this renewed sense of confidence and she starts going out to the nightclubs and hitting the bars and meeting men. Chasey Pointer lost a lot of weight and she started getting attention uh, from all these other men. She starts meeting a lot of men, and not just meeting them, but she's hooking up with them. Just from knowing, knowing her how, you know, from the stories I've heard from, I heard from Bob, she was always, always about her first. She even left their four-year-old in the care of Bob's teenage daughter, Natalie, while she went out to meet lovers. 
She's so bold that she actually has Natalie stay at home to babysit the four-year-old child while she goes out cheating on her dad. Chasey didn't seem to have too much concern about being caught, um, and that could be because she was just brazen or because she was wanting to be caught. But she would do things like leave her Facebook open with messages, uh, messages that can easily be read by anyone. And in an ironic twist of fate, just as it had been one of Bob's daughters who exposed his affair with Chasey, it was also one of his daughters who spotted provocative messages from Chasey to another man on the screen of her open laptop. So she goes to her dad and she tells her dad, you know, Chase is cheating on you. And she shows the evidence. Bob confessed to his closest colleague that the news had left him devastated, but that he wasn't willing just yet to call time on the relationship. He had gone through a divorce before and he did not want to go through that again. And, and it was all because of his daughter, you know, he, he did not want to hurt her that way, and he expressed that to me a lot. He says to, to Chasey, let's, let's try to patch things up. He did not want to leave that baby girl of his. Taking statements from the deceased firefighter's friends and family, detectives built a picture of a marriage that had, by 2016, turned seriously sour. But neither Bob nor Chasey was ready to end it. Did they have the same motives for sticking with their faltering relationship? In late summer, Bob suggested a make or break family holiday. Plans this vacation to Mexico and he tells his friends at work, we're really gonna try to work things out. I'm taking her on this romantic trip. Robert had found out that Chasey had been cheating on him a few days prior to the vacation, but they went down there uh, anyway to try to, you know, work things out one last time. And from what we could tell, it just didn't go very well at all. She was texting, uh, two of her different uh, men that she was having an affairs with constantly over this time period. So it appears whatever they wanted to accomplish, or Robert at least wanted to accomplish in New Mexico, did not happen. Uh, so it doesn't appear to have been a very, uh, you know, successful from his point of view, vacation and bringing the family back together. He called me the day they got back and he told me then, he's like, that's it. When he called me, you know, I just said, hey, how's it going, brother? And he said, not good. You know, that's it. I'm contacting my lawyer. Bob didn't seem really sure where his relationship was going in September. He emailed his divorce attorney. At the same time, he was text messaging Chasey, trying to find out if they could talk and get together and reconcile. He files um, for divorce, but he doesn't actually go through with it. It looked to detectives as though Bob still had hopes of saving the seven-year-old marriage. What they didn't yet know was if Chasey Pointer had wanted the same thing, or did she have something else in mind? She probably delighted in being this person who ran these long cons and came up with these plans and was able to get away with them. On September 8, 2016, Bob Pointer sent his divorce attorney a decisive message. I'm thinking of a surprise attack, he said. I want to sell the house and take full custody of our daughter. 36 hours later, the firefighter was dead. Combing the couple's electronic devices after the murder, investigators found the note to his lawyer and began to form a theory. We believe that she read the message he had sent uh, to uh, his attorney. When he told her that he was going to get a lawyer and file for divorce, I mean, he was dead the next day. And so she knew that she was fixing to lose everything. But it was when they began to search Chasey's phone that things became really interesting for detectives. If you look at uh, the text messages we got from her cell phone, uh, she was having multiple affairs. There were four different affairs that had gone on that we know of within the last uh, 12 months. Dr. Frederick recognizes one trait of potential killers that Chasey Pointer was showing in abundance. Psychopaths are known for being sexually promiscuous. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's probably not a requirement that they be attractive, right? Um, but, you know, she did have sort of this, uh, this, this, this femininity about her that she most likely used to her advantage. Um, quite successfully. Not only was she cheating, 
The messages suggested to cops that Chasey was manipulating her lovers, telling each of them that she wanted Bob out of her life. She was running this con on multiple men, almost in an indiscriminate way, kind of like just throwing anything at the wall and seeing what would stick. Charm, lies, manipulation, these are all characteristics of a psychopath. She talks about wanting him dead in multiple of these text messages to all these different men. Now, most of the men didn't take the bait. You know, they told her, leave him, call the police. The normal reactions that most people would have uh, if that were true. In a series of almost 10,000 text messages extracted by digital experts, Chasey offered her lovers a reason to help her escape her marriage. Chasey starts complaining that Bob is taking testosterone and steroids, she says, because he's treating a, a low testosterone problem, and she says it's making him uh, angry and abusive. It is very interesting that Chasey was already pinning these behaviors on Robert. It's almost as if she was already building a case against why he was a horrible person and why she had to do away with him. Chasey Pointer used uh, this sort of damsel in distress tactic on when she knew. She had all these lovers and uh, she let them all know that you know her husband was, um, was being abusive. It was a new angle for investigators. Was there any truth in Chasey's claims? And if so, was this a potential motive for murder? They questioned those who knew him best. Bob's grown daughter, Natalie, she's 16 at the time, moves in with them, and she, um, she lives there for about six months. And she says so she never, in that time that she lived with them, ever saw any evidence at all of any abuse. Chasey claimed that Robert was abusive towards her. And we found no evidence of that. Uh, we talked with his ex-wife who said Robert was a big old teddy bear. She did not act like a battered woman in any way that we could find. There was never any phone calls to police. Uh, none of her friends got up on the witness stand and testified to that. People who were friends testified the opposite, that, that Chasey was the dominant person in this relationship. Cops suspected it was all a fiction designed to entrap her lovers to let them all know she was being abused so that a knight in shining armor might come to her rescue. And she had so many of them that she was bound to find one that was so wrapped up in her story and who he thought she was that he might have seen it as an opportunity to save the person who he admired. I mean, this is, this is a Machiavellian trait, right? Cunning, manipulative, um, uh, and unscrupulous. On the morning after the murder, Detectives felt they had identified the man willing to be Chasey Stooge. On her phone search history, a link to a photo on the Facebook page of a man called Michael Garza, accessed on the day of her husband's death. Confronted with his name, Chasey's story changed. And now she finally admits she knows who this shooter was. It was Michael Garza. It was her boyfriend. You shot Robert. She uh, admitted to her affair with Michael Garza, admitted that they'd had sex the day of the murder, and said, I don't know, maybe he did this. At first, she insisted she had not known that Garza would be lurking in the shadows alongside the dirt road that night. But within minutes, her version of events shifted again. The relationship had begun a couple of months earlier, and Michael had fallen hard. This is what investigators uncover. Michael is just... He's bananas over her. He just he is madly in love with Chasey. Garza seemed to be quickly enamored with her and soon began saying he'd do anything for her or anything that she wanted him to do. Chasey has been, you know, she's been making the rounds with the guys, and she has been planning this story um, in anyone who will listen that her husband Bob is abusive and he has these horrible anger issues. Michael Garza is the one who took the bait, so I think she was kind of baiting all of these men to see who would tell her what she wanted to hear. Uh, and then she finally found that Michael Garza. But murder, Chasey told her interrogators, had never been the plan. During this interview, um, she told police that she wanted Bob to know what it's like to be bullied. She claimed that Garza was supposed to show up just to threaten Bob and tell him to leave her alone. 
Was this version of events believable? Had Michael Garza really gone rogue? The scheme Chasey laid out for detectives was an elaborate one. On the evening of September 9th, Chasey had contacted her husband. Chasey texts Bob and she says, yeah, I think we can really work this out. She says, I really love you, Bob. I really do. And she's texting in all caps, emphasizing that. Over the next couple of hours, she engages in these text messages with Bob, kind of like a cat and mouse game. And she's laying out this trap. Her plan was, uh, she told him, we're gonna meet up at Jack in the Box in Roy City for late night tacos. And that's something that they used to do. So he worked long hours and he might come home late at night and he would bring home Jack in the Box tacos for her. And then some more time goes by and she says, I'm almost, I'm almost there. The GPS says, I'm three miles away. 15 minutes later, Bob sends a text message and says, long three miles. In fact, all of this two hours worth of texting back and forth, this little game of hers, she never had any intention of meeting Bob at a restaurant. She's actually been having sex with Michael Garza all afternoon, all night, and they have a plan. Chasey set in motion a plot to lure Bob to a remote rural spot. She goes to, a, to this place on County Road 2595, which is a very secluded area. People, it's not a regularly traveled road. From there, she sent Bob another message. She needed his help, she said. She pretended to get her Jeep stuck. Bob, by nature and being her man, immediately responded to help her. Well, Bob's first responder instincts kick in right away, and he jumps in his truck and he heads out to rescue his damsel in distress. It was a decision that cost Bob his life, but one that did not surprise those who loved him. I had no idea that he was going out there. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell anybody, you know, that he was doing that. He would just do it. I'm going to help. That's just how he was. When he reached the dirt road, Bob found Chasey waiting at the turnoff. She told him the Jeep was a little way down the track. At this point, Chasey would tell detectives Garza was meant to confront her husband, perhaps rough him up, but nothing more. This was all Michael Garza's idea. I, n I didn't even know he had a gun. But then she admitted to a, uh, a plan of what they were gonna do after the fact, which was gonna be to burn the truck uh, that he was in. Whatever Chasey had intended, the outcome for Bob Pointer was a sudden and brutal death. She met him there. Uh, she walked back to the road and she walked him down that road, hand in hand. After he sat in the vehicle, he was immediately shot in the head with a shotgun at close range. Had Chasey known what was coming, had she planned the whole thing? Or was she as shocked and devastated as she appeared to be? Police don't believe Chasey's story. It just isn't adding up. They know she's involved. Chasey is arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. But could they prove it? The only person who could help answer that question was Michael Garza. He was, at first, nowhere to be found. They issue a warrant for Michael Garza, but he's gone. He's already hit the road. But you can see from cell phone records his, him rapidly leaving the area. After shooting Captain Robert Pointer dead, Chasey Pointer's boyfriend Michael Garza was quick to skip town. After she calls 911, he goes back to his house. He gets in his truck, he's a long haul truck driver, and immediately starts contacting his boss to try to pick up a, a, a route so he can get out of town. But Gaza didn't stay gone for long. He goes off for a while, and the, the murder happened on Friday night. He finally, he finds out that people are looking for him, of course, um, it's on the news, and uh, his family's calling him. He goes back, he turns himself in, but he's not talking. He eventually turns himself in and lawyers up on Sunday. With his lawyer alongside him, Michael Garza refuses to talk. Detectives still had nothing concrete to prove who was responsible for Bob Pointer's death. Police still need some hard evidence to connect Michael Garza to the murder. And then five weeks later, they get it. 
a farmer finds a shotgun out in his field. That shotgun was traced back to Garza's brother. We had his Facebook photo, which he quickly took down, but we got it before he did, of him holding that shotgun. So uh, uh, for Michael Garza's case, it was a big piece of evidence um, that we, we had. We also found shotgun shells that were fired by that shotgun on Michael Garza's uh, front porch and the flower bed around it. So for him, it was a big piece of evidence. Presented with the evidence, Garza turned on Chasey. Whenever you have these types of cases where two people work together uh, to commit a murder, they're gonna point the finger at each other. It's all that other person's fault. Michael Garza insisted Chasey had acted alone. His story was basically that he didn't, hadn't seen Chasey since sometime around 9, 9.30. Uh, he thought she was abused, so he gave her a shotgun and um, some man-killing slugs, and that she did it all herself. Chasey, meanwhile, was sticking with her story. What she tried to do was say that this was basically all Michael Garza's plan and that she had nothing at all to do with it. Who killed your husband? Who shot Robert? Who killed your husband? Who killed She was trying to do what she always did, which is save her own skin. And she, so she would, it's not a surprise to me that she would say and do anything to try to keep herself from going to prison for the rest of her life. With no confession from either suspect, prosecutors would have to try to persuade a jury at trial that Chasey Pointer and Michael Garza were both guilty of murder. They needed to establish a motive. If Chasey had wanted out of her marriage to Bob, why simply not divorce him? Investigators found the answer. It lay in the couple's financial arrangements. I believe um, that it was totally about the money. Robert Pointer made very good money. He made over $100,000 a year uh, as a captain with the University Park uh, Fire Department. He worked a lot of overtime. He bought her a lot of nice things, let her redo the houses like she went and bought her a Jeep. Um, she wanted to get breast enhancements. So she became accustomed to that lifestyle that he could provide for her. Perhaps Bob suspected that this lifestyle was part of what made him attractive to Chasey. When they married, he asked her to sign a prenup. And it gives you the indication that perhaps Robert didn't fully trust Chasey. After all, he didn't really know her very well at the time that they were getting married. And perhaps he just wanted to safeguard his assets in case she wasn't very sincere about her actual love for him. The prenup stated that Chasey would not be entitled to Bob's money if they ever divorced. Instead, it would be split between Bob's three daughters, two from his first marriage and one his youngest with Chasey. On the other hand, Bob's death would leave Chasey sitting pretty. Police find there was a life insurance policy, a $680,000 life insurance policy that Bob had. And uh, Chasey had talked him into changing it so that instead of his daughters, she would be the primary beneficiary. Now, if Robert Pointer died, that prenuptial agreement doesn't come into play. And she would get, she was the beneficiary of his life insurance policy, which was worth over $600,000. Uh, she would have got a pension on top of that, a survivor benefit pension, all the assets. I mean, it was worth, you know, probably close to a million dollars of total assets that she would have got. Armed with a motive, the Hunt County DA's office brought new charges against their primary suspect. Chasey's charge actually has now been upgraded to capital murder. Uh, she's accused of conspiring with Michael Garza to kill her husband in order to get that money. Garza was the first to face the jury. I felt it was a good case against Michael Garza, um, but I mean, I didn't think it was a slam dunk. Now, Michael Garza had actually taken the stand in his own defense during his trial, and he actually tried to put the blame on Chasey. Garza told the court that he couldn't have murdered Robert Pointer because he was tending to a sick animal on the family farm. He repeated his claim that he had simply supplied the weapon and it was Chasey who'd pulled the trigger. Would the jury buy it? Prosecutors had evidence of the trucker's willingness to go to extreme lengths for his lover. I knew that you know, we needed the right jury uh, to convict him and, and luckily we did. On July 20, 2018, Michael Garza was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 99 years in prison. 
it was Chasey Pointer's turn to stand in the dock. I felt much stronger about that case. We had her at the scene of the crime. We had her text messages uh, where they're talking about uh, getting rid of Robert Pointer. And then we had her statement uh, to law enforcement. Chasey continued to deny murder and to point the finger at Michael Garza. The plan was all his, she claimed. He had taken the initiative after hearing of her abuse at the hands of Bob Pointer. Once again, witnesses were all too willing to contradict her claims. We had a big gallery out there. All of Robert's uh, family was there. Uh, a lot of people from the University Park Fire Department was there. And several of them testified in the trial to talk about the relationship between Chasey and Robert that they had observed. A forensic expert took the stand to talk about crime scene evidence. He told the court that Chasey had blood spatter all over her neck, legs, and arms. She claimed she got it when she jumped into the Jeep to check on Robert. But the pattern of blood did not match up. It looked as though she had been very close to Bob in the moment he was shot. It was another claim that just didn't stack up, and the jury was not fooled. Her story uh, was bad. It was not well rehearsed. I mean, her defense attorneys were kind of leading her to say certain things. Uh, that clearly weren't true because other evidence contradicted what she said. But when you look at the text messages, um, it's pretty clear uh, that she uh, was the one who initiated this, that she wanted it to happen, and she wanted that, it to happen quick. Chasey had not anticipated the weight of digital evidence that would stack up against her. It was a lot easier to manipulate a man you're having the sex with than law enforcement and people who can go look at all of your text messages. Chasey was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Her earliest chance at parole would be the year 2046. At that time, she'll be almost 60 years old. For detectives and prosecutors, it was a good verdict. I believe she was the most culpable person here. Michael Garza was the person she found to do this, but she was the driving force behind this murder. I would have been completely happy with the death penalty for both of them. They didn't give him that option of life. So, you know, my head was, you know, it would have been fine with me if they got that too. The investigation into Bob Pointer's murder had exposed Chasey's multiple affairs and a plot to cash in on his insurance policy. On the very night that Chasey was having her husband Bob killed, she was actually texting with another lover and planning to hook up with him later that night. This was the just a, a classic tale of, you know, sex, lies, and greed. What's going on? My husband, he went to go help me. My Jeep is stuck in the back around the corner, and he's been shot. I, I knew as soon as he told me that, that she had something to do with it. That's all I shot him. That's all I saw. And it just, as soon as he told me, it struck me that that's who it was. I, I didn't know all the details, but I knew she had something to do with it. I think you're full of crap. I, want to I'm you pull the trigger. I don't know who pulled the trigger. With Bob's scheming wife jailed, the insurance money went to his three daughters. She was the biggest liar that I've ever seen in any 11 years of doing this. Uh, and she was pretty good at it uh, for a while. I don't know if she did it. I don't know that. When you talk to her family members, they didn't seem surprised that she did this. I think that says something. They knew from a young age that she was an awful person. You know, she may be in that sociopath category, just couldn't feel anything for anybody but herself. The opposite of her much admired husband, an all-American hero. He was a class act, a true brother in the fire service, a great dad, and He's just a good man overall and a good friend, and I miss him every day. Captain Bob Pointer's send-off revealed how his death had struck at the core of this tight community on the edge of Dallas. His funeral on September 15th, 2016, was very emotional and very beautiful. Um, it was attended by his fellow firefighters from the University Park Fire Department, uh, as well as firefighters and police officers from all over the state of Texas. They came to pay their respects. I don't even know how to describe it. It was, 
You've never been to a firefighter funeral. Just, you know, all the the bagpipes and, and the other firemen from and police officers, was, you know, from the surrounding communities coming. And just seeing his, you know, family, his mom, who's, you know, one of the sweetest ladies ever, and and watching, you know, the distress on her face and her and his and his daughters. At the end, they always ring the bell. It's like you're, you know, they set the tones off and uh, where his time is over, you know, and, and that was rough, rough, knowing that that was it. It was the worst day in, in, in my time there, 20 years. Chasey thought that she could seduce, scheme, lie, and cheat her way through life, using one man after another to get what she wanted. Sex, lies, buddy, and murder. I mean, that's really what this case is about. She used social media to ensnare men as her lovers, to smear her husband Bob as an abuser, and to recruit the man who would one day agree to kill for her. In doing so, she left a digital trail that would one day be unraveled by homicide detectives, a trail that would lead them directly to her door. That was the killer's mistake. An elderly man is attacked in his home. They found John uh, laying at the uh, bottom of the stairs. Um, glasses were, were close to him, just off his face. John Proctor was a man without enemies. No one appeared to have a motive for his murder. John was one in a million. He was fantastic. A suspect emerges, a family woman, middle-aged. Susan Warren's case is an illustration of a woman driven, obviously wild, with despair, irrational thoughts and feelings. How had Susan Warren's life taken such bad turns? Would evidence prove she had killed John Proctor? Which part of the puzzle would reveal the killer's mistake? Suffolk is not a hotbed of crime. In summer 2015, murder came calling. My name is Kevin Haywood. Um, I worked as a detective inspector on the major investigations team um, for Suffolk Constabulary, and I was a senior investigating officer investigating the murder of John Proctor that occurred on the 13th of June, 2015. The senior detective hears a good Samaritan story of a grim discovery and of the life of a man without enemies. John Proctor was an 80-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, lived on his own. He'd been adopted by a lady who lived in Leiston 70-odd years ago, and that lady had adopted another daughter five or six years later. So they become brother and sister, if you like, within that family environment. John never married, never had any children himself, uh, but his sister went on to have four children, uh, and he was always well known as uh, uncle to uh, those four children and, and were quite a, a family unit within that area. He remained living in the same home that he moved into uh, with his uh, foster parents all those years ago and when his foster mother passed away he took over the running of the home. Problem one for detectives, John Proctor lived alone, probably no witnesses. The discovery of his murder came because of an eagle-eyed concerned local. On a warm and sunny Monday morning in June, a neighbor noticed that John Proctor's curtains were not open. 
He went to inquire to check on John um, as he went round to his next door neighbours. They lived in a little terraced street in um, Leiston. He found the back door to be insecure. John Proctor was an independent man. He was organised, tidy, and a creature of habit. When his curtains weren't opened, that rang alarm bells. What the neighbour found was the mayhem of a murder scene. He walked in, and as he went into the building, he found John laying at the bottom of the stairs um, with what looked to be a knife uh, in his neck. It was a scene of absolute horror, a scene that that neighbour may never forget. Word of the grotesque discovery in this quiet coastal town quickly spread. Within 15 minutes, the street was abuzz with vehicles, uniforms, and local reporters like Tom Potter. We had learned that there was a police cordon uh, in Grimsey Road, um, which is quite a, a large residential street off one of the main roads in Leiston. We banded together and tried to get as close to what seemed to be the property in question, but it was very, very difficult to, to get anywhere near that. It must have been something serious for, the, for that kind of level of police response. Potter and fellow journalists would soon learn just how serious the situation was. Though paramedics rushed to the scene, the victim, still not named, couldn't be helped. We learned that there was a, it was a man in his 80s who had been found uh, two days, I think he had been dead for, for a couple of days. There didn't look to be any kind of um, fight that had gone on in, in the address itself, very um, compact, tiny, but tidy address, um, assessed the scene, uh, and with uh, a crime scene investigator, uh, made a decision to call this an unexplained death at that moment in time, which needed um, further explanation. Murder squad detectives are slow to jump to conclusions. They follow the evidence. An elderly man, no signs of a struggle. Had he fallen whilst holding a knife which had become embedded in his neck? Was this a random attack? Or was it something more targeted? On day one of the inquiry, many more questions than answers. John's body removed for post-mortem. Detectives brought in specialist teams. Crime scene investigators entered the address, looking for anything that's out of ordinary, um, looking for potential evidence in the form of either fingerprints or any DNA evidence that may well have been left by any kind of offender, anything that looks um, unnatural to the address it is, which would have been seized and taken for further forensic e examination. It would be a waiting game whilst forensic evidence was analysed. In the meantime, Suffolk Police relied on old-fashioned detective work. Who had seen what and when? We um, start to make house-to-house -house inquiries around um, John's house, spoke to the neighbours and also established who the family members were and start to get into the family to understand what we call the victimology of John, to understand the background, how he lived his life. He was an 80-year-old man, but very fit, very active. Neighbours reported that he was a, a, a man in, in really good health. John uh, left his life very quietly, um, got, went around his business in his own way, had his little job at the um, caravan park. A great British eccentric. Um, he was just a bit, bit different. Yeah, he, he just looked upon life differently. Caravan site owner Fergus Little knew John from childhood. To Fergus, John was the affable employee who never let him down. Always on time, always came in, um, always very pleasant to work around, just generally a nice guy, and yeah, he was, he was a good employee. Which made it all the more surprising when John failed to turn up for work that Monday morning. But we'd last seen him uh, the week before when he was at work. He'd come in, um, he used to do three days a week. We were expecting him to come into work that day. We heard, uh, I think, through one of the other members of staff's family member had said that the house was cordoned off. At the time, we didn't know what had happened, but that's when we knew there was something wrong. But the campsite staff did not imagine for a moment that John had been the victim of foul play. It never crossed our minds that something bad had happened. We assumed that he had passed away, and then when we heard it was cordoned off, it was a bit of, oh, I wonder what that's all about. He was a man with a lot of friends. Leiston wasn't a town known for violent crime. Detectives could find no obvious motive for murder. 
a very small, close-knit community. Um, John had lived in that street all his life. Um, everybody knew each other in that street, helped each other out. It's almost unheard of for something quite so serious to happen in Leyston. I mean, it's not absolved from it, all kinds of crime. Um, but when somebody is killed, um, then it sends shockwaves around the, that community. It was probably a day or so after um, where we'd obviously heard a lot of it was rumours and second and third hand, but after you heard enough that you realised that something hor horrific had happened. Understanding what the motive may have been to kill John Proctor would be vital in building a case. There was one clue to go on. It was tiny, but was it significant? What was noted was there was a wallet on the mantelpiece in the address, had John's driving licence in it, uh, but had no money in it. Had pensioner John been the victim of a robbery gone wrong? If so, there was no sign of forced entry. And there was evidence to suggest extreme force. When the post-mortem was complete, it was clear he'd suffered an attack of some brutality. He was found to have broken some bones, probably as a result of a heavy fall down the stairs. There were stab wounds to his neck, which, which uh, severed the, the carotid artery, and also uh, there were signs of strangulation. The cause of death was found to be compression of the neck, and it was believed that was caused by a curtain cord from John's own home. 80-year-old John Proctor had died in a deliberate act of violence, but at whose hands? Officers wanted to know more about the victim's final hours, keen to offer information with the shocked residents of Grimsey Road. On Saturday morning, one of the neighbours in the street had seen John in his garden, they'd had a conversation, um, so that helps us in narrowing the time down in knowing that um, John was still alive on that Saturday morning, uh, the 13th of June. A forensic pathologist attending John's home that Monday morning estimated that the victim had been dead for at least 24 hours when his body was found, which made the next part of the witness's statement all the more intriguing. The neighbours made another interesting revelation about John's final moments. He had been expecting a caller. John had told them that one of his nieces was having some kind of matrimonial problems and that they may well be coming to live with him for a few days. That niece was Susan Warne, one of John's four nieces, who now had to be told that their uncle was dead. He informed the family uh, and they were, again, completely shocked, devastated uh, as to how or why anybody um, would want to murder John in his own home. With little to go on during the first few hours after a murder, Suffolk police decide to build a picture of the crime scene, but also more about the victim. To understand the background, how he lived his life, um, and looking to narrow the times down as to when he was last seen, which helps us to identify who could have been the offender for this crime. What will emerge surprised detectives. Susan Warne was reported as having been with John on the day that he was killed, but it said nothing about it. In conversation with other family members, uh, it became apparent that she allegedly visited John on that Saturday. So we're starting to, to build up a bit of a picture of uh, a story that's not being um, quite right there at the moment. There were double takes all round. The suspect was from John's own family. What motive could Susan Warne possibly have to kill the uncle she appeared to have loved? Police officers investigating the murder of John Proctor were keen to find out the nature of a visit from one of his nieces on the day he was last seen alive by neighbours. Monday evening, we'd come to the conclusion that there was a story developing that Susan had visited John on that Saturday morning. A routine visit from niece to uncle, perhaps. Investigators try to get a picture of 41-year-old Susan Warne. John's niece, Susan Warne, grew up, got married, and had a couple of children and had a dog and would enjoy long walks in the fields that were merely a stone throw away from their home in Valley Road. She lived a fairly ordinary life. She owned a landscape gardening business and people said she was pretty good at that. But sadly, 
it all began to crumble. She was hospitalized with stomach issues, and shortly after, she sustained a shoulder injury. She had to quit that job and became a cleaner at the local Tesco in Saxmundham, which is quite close to Leyston. Something emerges during the inquiry which troubles the police. As detectives made inquiries of the family, it soon became clear that all was not well. Susan was going through a rough patch. Her marriage was in trouble. Why? Police learn of a damaging problem that she faced. Susan Warne um, had a gambling habit, uh, had grown up a number of debts in relation to uh, gambling. It had eaten away at her for, for some years and had got progressively worse. She was virtually destitute. Hayward and his team wanted to know how damaging can a gambling habit be to a woman's life? Examples like Susan's are far from rare. Liz Carter is a leading expert on gambling addiction. I always think with addiction there, but for the grace of God, go any of us. If we think about it, anything that we find enjoyable, we may be turned to in times of stress, be it a glass of wine, a box of chocolates, gambling. We need to be careful if we are regularly using anything particularly something that has very harmful effects. When we're feeling sad or scared or angry, if we're using it to change our mood for the better. For Liz Carter, losing the gardening job that she loved was the beginning of a downward spiral for Susan Warren. I work with lots of women, actually, who start gambling at a life stage which represents a loss of identity and a change of role. In Susan Warne's case, that there would have been a huge loss of self-esteem and I would expect, too, a, a loss of a way of staying mentally and emotionally healthy. Susan Warne was using gambling to escape the problems of her day-to-day -day life. She would regularly visit amusement parks in nearby seaside towns and would spend hours in front of the fruit machines. Soon, though, she realized that she had a means of getting a gambling fix without the need for hard cash. She had opportunities to bet literally at her fingertips. Online bingo. From her phone, she could lose money and fast. We learn more and more of her addiction to online bingo, which becomes more and more interesting to us. In my practice now, I'd say 98% of the women I work with are addicted to online gambling. It's a very, very similar psychology to the traditional slot machine. It's just staring at a screen, engaging in very repetitive behavior, where just for that time, Everything stops. She was looking for a distraction, but perhaps she thought she could turn things around and win herself some money. People often say to me, Liz, I had no idea. I cleared out my account until suddenly my card was refused and then panic sets in. And we've got to remember this is often a woman who is driven to please other people feels hugely ashamed and guilty at having lost all of the money. And so then resorts often to begging, stealing or borrowing in an attempt to win the money back. What had begun as an innocent pastime very quickly had become an obsession. It certainly seemed to be something that had built up over a number of years where um, Susan's probably started gambling online and, and become more and more uh, ingrained in that kind of um, behavior, gambling more and more money as people do, and then that's getting bigger and bigger. Susan's cleaning job was not well paid. She took home around 600 pounds a month. She couldn't afford to lose what little she did have. The salary or wage she was receiving just could not keep up with the demands of her addiction. Um, so she was spending money as quickly, or if not quicker, than she was earning it. Had her addiction led Susan Warne to kill her uncle. As they searched for motive, that was one theory police were investigating. 
deep analysis of her bank accounts told police that Susan was losing money at a rapid rate and over a long period. Of course, the bigger the debt, the bigger you gamble to try and pay off that debt. So it's a downward spiral of, um, of gambling that um, led to the position that she was in. Police interview anyone who knows her, and they discover that she had not revealed the full extent of her problem. Susan's friends and family knew things weren't quite right, but she wasn't much of a talker. A fact which did not serve her well. Would that make her more desperate? The ability to express our feelings helps us to stay well and if somebody is suppressing their feelings as it sounds like susan was then um, that burden can begin to feel intolerable susan's father said she wasn't one for discussing her problems but one christmas two years before all this came to a head she didn't buy anybody in the family a christmas present Despite her financial misery, Susan had carried on gambling. For a while, it can be an effective escapism. But of course, because it's gambling, um, that appeal, which is losing touch with reality, is also a huge part of the problem, because she's going to very quickly lose touch with the reality of how much money she spent until there's no more money. Evidence gathered by detectives established that Susan had lost thousands of pounds and had to take out a bank loan to cover her betting. Her husband had taken out a loan himself of 16,000 pounds to pay off her gambling debts. Susan's family clearly wanted to help, but they just didn't know how. Liz Carter believes helping out an addict this way out of debt was never going to be an answer. It's really tough to see a loved one suffering financially. But what I know is that to bail somebody out financially doesn't usually help because in absolute crisis, the person who's got the gambling addiction will absolutely mean what they say. You know, if you, if you give me this money, this will be the last time. I'm going to pay off my debts and I'll stop. And they mean it because in that crisis, they are in such pain, such desperation, they won't want to put themselves through that again. But the fact is that if they pay off their debts and they don't seek help, it's very, very likely that those cravings to gamble will arise again. Susan Warren's financial woes were clearly at the heart of events. In their search for motive, police also discover that her problems led her to break the law. Having exhausted all legitimate avenues to get money to feed her habit, Susan crossed one line, then another, then another. Susan had stolen money from her husband and her young son. Her desperation meant no one was safe from her thieving. She borrowed money from her father, and when she discovered that he had backed a winner in a horse race, she returned for more. She would borrowed money from her father, and then later on heard that he'd had a bit of luck on the horses, and then broke into his house and stole almost a thousand pounds from him. He reported it to the police but soon afterwards discovered that Susan was the culprit. He had her charged. But, as families so often do, they forgave Susan. Susan's lifestyle struck police as one which had already led her into a life of crime. How far would she go to get money? Would she kill? They hear she had been sleeping in her car. As they built the complete picture of events, what would they learn about the visit to her uncle on the day of his death? She had attended to Mr Proctor's address on that Saturday morning. She had told him that she was having um, matrimonial problems. Uh, Mr Proctor had taken her upstairs, shown her to the bedroom that she could stay in for a few, a few nights because she said that, um, told Mr Proctor that she'd been sleeping in, in her car. Perhaps John had heard on the family grapevine about Susan's addiction. Perhaps he had not. But he could not have known that just three days earlier, her need for money had caused her to do something even more shocking. A 90-year-old lady was attacked in the pretty little town of Walberswick, which has a population of only 380 people. Susan had tried to mug this lady, and this was only three days before John Proctor's death. We know that there was an attempted robbery by another woman, Susan Warren was charged with that. Um, she would later go on to face trial for, for that robbery. 
most women who've had a gambling addiction describe self-loathing, huge guilt, and the way they stop themselves thinking or feeling about the destruction that the gambling has caused is to repeat the gambling act, because when they're gambling, they're not thinking or feeling anything about their behavior. And of course, it just repeats the cycle. They gamble again, they beg, they steal or borrow to get money to gamble again. When they're gambling, they think and feel nothing. Afterwards, huge guilt and regret and remorse and the drive to gamble again to stop all of that for that moment. So by that stage, sadly, it's gambling at all costs. And I think that's what we saw with Susan. Susan's behavior had rapidly escalated from compulsive gambling to petty theft, to stealing from her own family, and now to violence. Susan Warren's case is an illustration of a woman driven, obviously wild, with despair, irrational thoughts and feelings, which are the consequence of a long-term gambling addiction. I think it's a terribly sad case, obviously, which was taken to the extreme. Though he did not know it, this was the emotional world of the woman that unsuspecting John Proctor had invited into his home, the niece to whom he had offered refuge. Susan was completely out of control. All she could think about was her gambling addiction and when she would get her next fix. As the news spread of John Proctor's death, Susan Warne appeared to respond as any loving niece might. But even as she played the part, her sisters were talking to investigators from Suffolk's police major crimes team. Susan Warne's secrets were about to be laid bare. They told the police about the money that she'd stolen from them and the loans that she'd taken out to cover her debts. But sadly, she just could not stop. Susan Warne's family was confirming further evidence of motive for the murder of John Proctor. The puzzle was becoming clearer. Warne had a money motive to rob her uncle. She had stolen from family members before. She was capable of violence. It was time to bring in Susan Warne for questioning. We were making inquiries with all uh, the four nieces. Um, police officers had been deployed to go and speak to Susan. But when detectives tried to speak to her, they discovered Susan had taken drastic action to escape their scrutiny. As they were on the way to go and speak to Susan, a phone call came in from Susan's husband to say that uh, a note from her had been left at her home address and that she'd gone off and nobody knew um, where she was at that particular time. Now the mission appeared to be to save the life of Susan Warren. Susan's husband, the neighbours and the police all set out to find her. They didn't know what they might find. Had she done herself some harm? What was her state of mind? Should they even approach her? There was a local search in the local areas. I believe there was a walkway where Susan used to walk a dog. As they combed fields near the family home, officers had more reason than ever to suspect they were tracking a killer. When we found a note at her home address, uh, all those things start to come together um, to, to lead to think that um, Susan's the suspect for the murder of, of Mr. Proctor. On the note, the words, I didn't mean for this to happen, and a chilling extra line. I'm sorry, um, I can't take it anymore. Um, police look after the children, the dog, uh, I can't take it anymore. Officers combed the area. As the night developed, uh, Susan was found underneath the tree, um, clearly uh, not well physically, so therefore she was found and removed to Ipswich um, Hospital. As news of Susan Warren's condition spread through the community, there seemed to be only one logical conclusion. Obviously, the guilt got to her. She wanted to attempt to take her, her life and, and wrote a note and, and took an overdose of painkillers. Assumptions were one thing. Would Susan Warren admit to this version of events that she had made an attempt on her own life because she had murdered her uncle. Detectives would have to wait 36 hours to find out. To 
Tuesday evening, um, Susan was arrested for the murder of John Proctor, um, taken to the Marksham Police Investigation Centre, uh, and therefore we, we started to speak to Susan uh, the following Wednesday morning. Police interviewed Susan about the murder of John Proctor, and initially she tried to deny it. She tells the police that when she last saw Uncle John, he'd been alive and in good spirits. We interviewed Susan for, on four occasions between Wednesday and Friday. Um, for the first three occasions, she told us her account that, um, yes, she didn't see John, she had nothing to do with his murder. Um, John, she says she finished John early on in the morning, um, but she says that she hasn't told him anything about a matrimonial breakdown. She says she just wanted to go and see him for a cup of tea. Um, we found that slightly strange because she'd not visited him since the Christmas uh, six, eight months ago. As officers pulled at the threads of Susan's story, it began to unravel. In their search for proof, they discovered that after visiting Uncle John that Saturday morning, Susan had taken a trip. She did tell us that she um, visited Lowestoft, and we did uh, do some CCTV work in around Lowestoft, and we did get her in the um, in one of the bingo venues, or leaving one of the big bingo venues in Lowestoft around that time. They had CCTV of Susan playing slot machines soon after John's death, and there was evidence from the bank of two substantial deposits into her account. We've done all the um, financial transactions as well, and what could be seen is that uh, bank transactions were chaotic, lots of money going in and out. On the Monday morning, two deposits made of £150 into her account. We think that the money may well have been deposited over the weekend, but only registered on the Monday when the banking system um, started to come, come live again on that Monday morning. Was there any significance in the amount that Susan had deposited into her bank account over the weekend? There was some evidence in those deposits that equated to something close to the uh, same value of money that would be stolen from uh, Mr Proctor's home. Were the cash deposits in a bank a killer's mistake? Was that evidence enough? Would a jury be happy to accept, beyond reasonable doubt, that Susan had murdered John Proctor? At that point, Suffolk Police's digital specialists discover something else, a confession. We uh, took possession of Susan's mobile phone, and there was a sort of video log on that mobile phone that we managed to extract. The video content said something along the lines of, I'm sorry for what I've done, I can't take it anymore, um, I love you all. We felt that that was that apology was to do with um, what had happened to John, because John had never been in any way harmful to, to Susan at all throughout his life. Who knows why Susan chose that moment to confess? Maybe it had all become too much for her, or perhaps she just wanted to unburden herself. As we put that content of that video diary to Susan in an interview and, and put the question to her that had she uh, was she responsible for Mr Proctor's death she uh, broke down put her head in her hands uh, said yes I can't take it anymore I need to tell you the truth only after Susan's confession did forensics come back confirming what detective Kevin Haywood and his team already knew to be true we um, sent the knife that was um, that killed Mr. Proctor away for forensic examination, uh, and the way the, the forensic scientists worded it is, it was one in a billion more likely that the DNA represented on the knife was from Mr. Proctor and Susan Warren than any other person. Six days after his death, his niece was finally ready to tell the truth about the final moments in the life of John Proctor. The case against Susan Warne appeared to detectives ready to take to court. They gathered the evidence to complete the picture. Her descent to murder had begun on her payday. We believe that um, she'd received her um, monthly salary on the Friday um, before the murder. And from what we can see from her gambling um, habits, she gambled all that money away on the Friday night. So that probably tells you how far um, Susan Warren was into 
gambling those kinds of sums of money and how desperate she was for that buzz to go gambling again on Saturday to, to warrant um, murdering her, her uncle, who she's known all her life in his own home. Police pieced together the minute-by-minute -minute details of events of June 13th, 2015, the day that Warren visited her uncle with a sob story. On the 13th of June, Susan went round to visit her uncle. She claimed that her husband had thrown her out and she had nowhere to stay. And of course, John let her in. John was a very kind-hearted man. He wasn't going to let any woman uh, be alone on the streets with nowhere to go, least of all his niece. So of course, he let her in. She had attended to Mr Proctor's address on that Saturday morning. She had told him that she was having um, matrimonial problems. He trusted her uh, and he invited her into her home um, when she had nowhere to live. He showed Susan upstairs to the bedroom where he told her she could stay. What happened next was truly shocking. Susan wasn't there to play happy families. She was relying on her uncle's generosity to take pity on her and to help her in her moment of need. She pushed uh, Mr Proctor down the stairs. The meticulous detective work establishing a motive that Susan may have had to attack her uncle became crucial to understanding events. We think that um, she went there to, to steal some money. She just saw it as, a, as an opportune time to cause Mr Proctor's harm, to allow her um, to steal um, from him and from his home. Susan has never admitted if she planned everything that came next or if she was simply acting on blind instinct. John sustained fractures and significant bruises. He's lying at the bottom of the stairs, but that's not enough for Susan. Warren could have chosen to stop the attack at this point. She could have called an ambulance. She could have simply fled the scene. What she chose to do instead was finish her uncle off. She strangled him with a curtain cord. In that terrible moment when she feared being discovered, that it would have been just a reaction, I imagine, to pure fear. You know, here's the moment at which everything that I've been hiding through shame and guilt is going to be discovered. Instant, instinctive reaction to terror. And she wasn't finished, as she would tell officers who sat across the table from her in a police interview that warm, humid Friday in mid-June, six days since John Proctor had been killed. She explained that he'd been making gurgling noises that she'd found too hard to bear. She'd stabbed him in the neck, and when he carried on making those noises, she'd stabbed him again. She said the reasons that she did that was because he would be able to identify her, that she pushed him down the stairs, um, so that she needed to kill him. Warren had gone from being an ordinary wife, mother and worker, a well-loved, if not particularly attentive niece, to becoming a desperate addict and now a killer. When Susan turned to gambling, this was the path she had started down, one that she never managed to get off. When somebody is in the grip of an addiction, they have moved almost entirely from that rational thought process into reactions. So I feel sad, I'm going to give in to that. Or I feel angry, I can't control my anger. I feel scared, I need to run and hide. Or in Warren's case, to rob and kill. I see in my consulting room every day examples of women who no longer recognize themselves because of the desperation that they've been driven to as a result of gambling addiction. Susan really used the love and affection that John had for her as his niece to prey on his trust. What Warren did after killing Uncle John might be seen as the result of an irrational need to feed a habit or a lack of concern for the man who lay lifeless in his own hallway. 
on her own admission, she then stole somewhere close to £300 from the wallet that we'd found devoid of money at the early stages of the inquiry. Then went out to dinner with her husband and her children as though nothing had happened. This case is uh, quite severe. It, it, the gambling addiction must have been um, massive for, for Susan Warren to kill a man that she'd known all her life uh, for, for a small sum of £300. A gambling addiction begun with seaside slot machines and a woman down on her luck and compensated for it by risking money she did not have. The cause, in my experience, lies for women often in feeling they are living lives that they, they can't tolerate, taking on what she feels are overwhelming burdens to care for others at home and at work and feeling very guilty about taking time for herself. This often has led to her feeling very stressed, very anxious and very depressed. And quite by chance, in most cases, she's found that when she's gambling, typically in front of a traditional slot machine or on a computer screen or her smartphone, then all of that stops. It acts almost as a, an anti-anxiety or an antidepressant. At that time, she's gambling. Nothing else matters. A comfort for Warren in the short term, but before long, she was utterly in the grip of her habit. When someone has an addiction, um, that person is unrecognizable to themselves. They're being driven by strong emotions and irrational thought. The desperation to get money is not only about covering their tracks where the addiction is concerned, but it is also desperation to get the fix. Getting her fix had cost an innocent man his life and devastated a family and community. This was somebody who, who admitted what they had done. Um, she clearly realized how bad her addiction had become. Her family didn't really gather um, just how bad it had become. And I think that they were very sorry for that and didn't see it coming. There are just no winners in any of these kind of scenarios. Mr. Proctor's lost his life, and Susan's lost at least 20 years of her life incarcerated in prison, and her family has suffered as well as a result of this. At the trial, the judge compared Susan's addiction to gambling to that of a heroin addict. Susan was trapped in this cycle of always wanting more, always wanting another high, another fix. Most people look at a case like this with incredulity and think, well, how on earth could somebody end up with such a problem? Um, it's really unthinkable. On 16th October 2015, Susan Warren pleaded guilty at Ipswich Crown Court to murder. For the family and community who didn't know how to help her, the loss of a kind man and of a woman herself lost to gambling. I think it makes it just that much more horrific, that much sadder, really. I think that there was some level of sympathy for, for Susan Warren, particularly in her own family. They said that gambling addictions were, were a taboo subject, and when she was sentenced, they even went as far as to appeal for people to discuss it more, for it to become more of a public issue, uh, because it, it is a hidden harm. For detectives, a textbook example of how to build a case. Establishing a motive for murder, in this case, robbery. Narrowing down the suspects, Susan Warren had been at the scene of the crime. Analyzing the reason she had to steal, her gambling. It was a weight of evidence to put to her. Immediately after the event, I think she tried to get away with it as much as she possibly could. You know, it took four days of the investigations and two, three days of interviews with her and good quality interviewing skills from the, the detectives from the murder team for her to make that admission. An admission which only followed one other key piece of evidence, the killer's mistake, to record her confession and fail to destroy the phone. As we put that video diary to Susan in an interview and, and put the question to her that had she uh, was she responsible for Mr Proctor's death she uh, broke down put her head in her hands uh, said yes and then gave us a full account as to how um, she was responsible for Mr Proctor's death.